Airports, airport buildings tend to be <clears throat> expansive, and what I mean by that is the horizontal dimension tends to be quite a bit larger than the vertical dimension, which means that we have large available surface areas of roof. And from a daily lighting point of view, this is very desirable. <clears throat> um, roofs have the advantage compared to walls that they um, are exposed to the entire sky vault, which means that we can select light that's appropriate to whatever, whatever sort of uh, illumination conditions we want to produce inside the building. Uh, the glazing can also be located and sized in a way so that we can get whatever distribution of light we want inside the building. So one of the simplest concepts that we can have for a daylighting system is to simply cut a hole in a horizontal roof, which we typically call a skylight. Uh, skylights have the advantage that they gather light from the full sky vault, and as a consequence, they're very efficient in terms of the amount of light that they collect per unit area of glazing. Um, to talk about some of the downside of them, uh, in this diagram, we're showing a sort of conceptual little building with an opening in the roof, and you see some red needles which represent the sun angles on the summer solstice on June 21st, and some green needles that represent the sun angles uh, during the winter solstice on December 21st. One of the things you want to note is there are a lot more red needles than green. This is at 36 degrees north latitude, by the way. So it's just an example we're taking. There are a lot more red needles than green, and that's a manifestation of the fact that our days are longer during the summertime than during the wintertime. You'll also notice that the red needles are incident on this aperture at a, an angle that's much more favorable to being accepted through the aperture. So in Raleigh, North Carolina, for example, when we run the data for the month of June and the data for the month of December, it turns out that a horizontal aperture of this sort co collects three times as much light and heat during the month of June than it does the month of December. This is the exact opposite of what we want from a thermal point of view or a psychological point of view. We don't want to make our buildings hotter in the summer and colder in the winter, but we also crave the light more during the winter time, and so from a psychological point of view, this is not as desirable. It also has a lot of beam sunlight incident on the aperture, which can be a source of glare. We don't want beam sunlight hitting people in the eye. We can take care of that problem by introducing a diffusing glazing, but even that doesn't solve our problems. For example, if we set the transmission of that glazing so that we have exactly the right amount of light when there's a cloud over the sun, then when the cloud goes away, the light level and the thermal level goes up by a factor of seven. So a thermal overload of a factor of seven is not what we want. Another interesting phenomenon happens because when the cloud comes back, people have been operating in that space with an extremely bright environment. And when the light level suddenly drops, even though it may be high enough to meet our prescribed level of illuminance, people will still turn on the electric lights because they perceive that there's not enough light there. So this is an adaptation problem, which often negates any energy benefits that we might get out of this system uh, because people perceive that the light level changes too much. Sometimes we've invented <clears throat> systems to try to control this problem. I was in a library once that had a large, uh, expansive skylight system and above it were me mechanized louvers, and these louvers were designed to respond very quickly to changes, and we, we need to do that because a cloud can come over literally in a few seconds. And I remember being in this library on a partly cloudy day when the sun was coming and going, and everyone in the library was completely distracted by this humming sound that kept coming from these louvers moving back and forth. So we need a reliable system, and we need a system that's not distracting. That particular system got dismantled or uh, laid to rest in about a month because the patrons in the library found it too distracting. Um, we can also try things like electrochromic glazing, but we've been working on that for 40 years, and the best we can do now is a, about a five to 10 minute transition time. 
So let's look at some other orientations. If we had east facing glazing, and by the way, I'm talking about a roof configuration and what you're looking at here, uh, whoops, looks more like a building with an east facade. This would be part of a sawtooth roof or something like that. Um, but we're mainly looking at the incident angles on the glazing. And basically this has no advantages over horizontal glazing because it has all the same problems except it's only facing half of the sky vault, so we need roughly twice as much glazing. So we have twice the cost and twice, twice the thermal problems that are associated with it. Uh, tilted north facing glazing is even worse. It collects beam sunlight all day long during the summertime, gets no beam sunlight during the wintertime. In Raleigh, North Carolina, the summertime acceptance is seven times what it is um, during the wintertime. Uh, south facing works pretty well in that we're now getting we're now getting some nice beam sunlight during the winter time. We have to put diffusers or something that protects us from the glare, but from a thermal and psychological point of view, that's wonderful. In the morning and late afternoon, the beam sunlight uh, is rejected due to the east and west walls. Um, if it's just horizontal glazing. Uh, we have a certain amount of light that comes in around midday, but we can solve that problem with an overhang. So one of our favor, favorite orientations is south-facing glazing with an overhang. We can also do pretty well with north, and I apologize, I don't have a graphic for that. But if, so if you can imagine this, which is currently rendered as a south-facing piece of glazing, keep the glazing there, but take the mirror image and just flip the building around on the other side what the building does is it gets rid of all the beam sunlight during the wintertime, which is not too bad because it is a source of glare. And now what was accepted in the south aperture is going to get rejected by the roof and what was previously rejected by this east wall, once the east wall is moved over here, that light is now going to penetrate that north wall. That light is occurring very early in the morning or very late in the evening and from a glare point of view it's not a serious problem, and also from a thermal point of view, it's not a serious problem. So basically, our preferred orientations are north and south, or the combination of north and south. So this might be an example. This is a sawtooth roof, where we have a south-facing slope, north aperture. And in this case, we have a very sweet combination, because we can put photovoltaics on the south-facing slope, and we're harvesting beam sunlight for what it's really good for. Um, and in the meantime, we're bringing in mellow and very well-behaved north, north sky. We can make a south aperture work also if we have an overhang and we put some diffusing elements. It still has the problem that uh, there's potential glare and there's large uh, fluctuations in light level. And then we can do the combination of north and south. So that's what this might look like in sections. Now, so far, what I've shown you are some sort of classic sawtooths, which have this kind of rag ragged aesthetic. And I've just included this to show you that, in fact, you can do this kind of building and get really great fluid grace. OK, so, so far I've said we can do north and south glazing. And the, the reality is that many airports are constrained in a way where a long concourse building can only have a particular orientation. So one of the things we can do with that is we can say, we're going to configure the building where this may be the long face on each side, and this is north, for example. We can put in a north-facing aperture, and that produces an interesting dynamic on the inside of the space where the apertures are diagonal to the primary faces. Uh, we can even reshape that slightly by extending this taper. And if that feels a little too uh, clunky, we can approximate this with a nice curved uh, aperture like the following. We can even remove some of these spaces that are uh, not necessarily needed, and that will produce a sort of a north-facing uh, facade and a south-facing facade. And then we can even serrate it so that we have nothing but cardinal directions for the walls. This has some problems, of course, but it's a very interesting idea. So we can do this with, saw, with um, north and south vertical glazing, and we've studied this extensively. Uh, it behaves very well. It does save energy. 
The biggest problems are that the glazing is 20 percent of the floor area, which adds a lot of cost and thermal heat loss, and we would like to save more energy than that. So that brings us back to the fact that we would love to do something with this horizontal aperture that faces up towards the sky, but we have this problem, this huge problem with the beam sunlight, which we'd like to get rid of. So what we would like is a magic material that accepts diffuse skylight and rejects beam sunlight. And we have that material now. Um, this is an aluminous meter inside a box. This is the same with the glazing in front of it. We've taken some data, and rather than labor the details, I'll tell you that it's 46% per transmissive for diffuse skylight and less than two for beam sunlight. So we have rejected 98% of the beam sunlight. This is roughly the aperture size that we would need if we include this in a multi-layer system with R5. Uh, we need about a 10% opening inside of a floor module of that size. And so now we're looking at how to incorporate this system. Now it has one problem that I didn't mention, which is this glazing needs to face into the sun, so it needs to track the sun which means it has to rotate one full rotation every 24 hours. So it's a very simple, very slow, very robust, and very inexpensive mechanism, but it does have to rotate. And when you say it have to, has to rotate, that suggests we need a round aperture. So we want to work on the optimization of this, but this is roughly what that might look like in one manifestation. 